We all pray. In quiet times, at meal times, or bedtime. We pray when we are together, and we pray when we're alone. We thank God for our blessings. We turn to God for help when we are scared, sick, or feeling alone. We want God to guide us in a future that is uncertain. And still there are times when we wonder if God is listening. Why is prayer so hard? We wonder if we're even doing it right. And we ask, how should we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is. Good morning, and welcome to worship with First United Methodist Church. I'm so glad you are joining us today. Before we begin our service, I would like to let you know about a few ways First Church is making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This is First Things First. For the month of July, the food pantry will be collecting food items for the homeless. Canned food with a pull top lid, food you can eat from a pouch, or other prepackaged food items. You can put your donations in boxes located in the narthex in the connector. On Tuesday, July 5th, the young adults have a dinner planned at Holy Taco in Boone's Creek at 6 o'clock, followed by a time of fun at Paradise Acres at 7 o'clock. If you want to attend or get more information, contact Steve Reese. Our student intern, Nathan Duggar, will be leading two trips this summer for our senior adults. On July 16th, the group will enjoy a dinner theater in Virginia, and on July 29th, the group will visit the Ash County Frescoes. Transportation for these trips will include Clifford the Big Red Van. If you wish to learn more about these trips or reserve your spot, please reach out to Nathan Duggar. We want to invite the whole church to a potluck luncheon on July 17th to celebrate the years of ministry Sharon and Drew Craddock have given our youth. The church will provide a ma the main course and you can bring a side, a salad, or a dessert to share. There will also be an opportunity to give Sharon and Drew a love offering, gift card, or other small gifts during the celebration. 
If you are worshiping with us in person today, please take a moment to sign the registration pad located at the end of your pew. And if you're joining us online, please leave a comment to let us know you are here and maybe share the service with a friend. We hope this service will bless and encourage you. That's all for now. We'll have more for you next week on First Things First. Well, good morning. As we prepare our hearts and our minds this morning, would you join me in reading our call to worship? Praise be to God, whose ears are open to our prayers. God brings us up out of trouble and sets us in a safe place. Let us open our hearts to God's compassion and care. We will lift our voices in joyful praise to the true and living God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we rest today in the knowledge that you know our hearts, you see our needs, and you are always with us. 
By your Spirit, draw us closer to you and lead us on your pathways of peace and hope. Teach us the joy of serving others so that our lives will always be a witness to the redeeming love of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We worship a mighty God whose goodness is evident all around us, but the ways of the world cling to us, and we struggle to live as God intends us to live. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sins. God of perfect love, you continually bring forth life, transforming sadness to joy and despair to hope. We live in those chains, not believing that there is any other way. We, we harbor jealousies and are quick to anger. We neglect the needs of others and gratify our own desires. Forgive us, O oh God, and open our minds to your freeing love. Forgive us, O oh God, that we might serve you by opening doors of With abundant grace and boundless mercy, God hears our prayers and offers us new life. Sisters and brothers, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and free to live in love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, beginning in the first chapter with verses 12 through verses 16. Hear now the words of the Gospel. 
Once, when he was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he ordered him to tell no one, Go, he said, and show yourselves to the priest, and as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing, for a testimony to them. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases, but he would withdraw to deserted places and pray. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to take a moment to thank all of you for your prayers on behalf of my mother and my family, uh, all of you who have reached out over the past couple of weeks. That has been a great blessing, uh, and I know that Others who have been in similar situations have felt that blessing as well. To know that you are prayed for and cared for by your church family is such a blessing. And in that spirit, let us now turn our hearts in prayer. Lord God, this weekend many of us will make time to celebrate with our community the Independence Day holiday. And we are grateful to live in a place that promises freedom to all people, that promises to treat all people fairly and equally. We pray that you will guide us as a nation to live up to those promises. To the many people who still feel the weight of oppression in this land of the free, open our eyes and open our hearts. Bless our nation with the courage and conviction to declare that all people, no matter their race or their gender or their sexual orientation or their age or their failings or their accomplishments or even their religion, are still your children and should be allowed to live freely in the life that you have made for them. Thank you for letting us live in a country where we can work to make it better to make it more in line with your will as revealed in your prophets and in your son, Jesus Christ. And even as we gather to celebrate, Lord, we also know that many concerns weigh us down. We have friends and families who are sick and need your healing. We know many who are dying or grieving and who need your comfort. There are so many of your children who face violence today and need your peace. For all who are suffering, be it in mind or body or soul, we long to be made clean, to be made whole. So we call on you, Lord, to stretch out your hand and touch us with your healing spirit. We trust that you are with us in every trial we face, and in every moment of joy. And so we join our voices to pray the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand and sing with me? When 
I was a stranger knocking at your door. You took me in with no questions and no conditions. When I was a sinner running from your grace, you called me friend. You called me friend. Cause there are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome. There's grace enough. When I have wandered, Lord, your cross is the open door. There are no outsiders. I'm not an outsider. the harbor in every tempest when my soul was shipwrecked tossed upon the waves you calm the storm you are the father there are no orphans every tribe and nation gathered in your arms sings with one voice sing with one there are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome. There's grace enough. When I have wandered, Lord, your cross is the open door. There are no outsiders. I'm not in. I was poor, I was thrown upon your shores, I was homeless and afraid, till I heard you call my name, and now I'm ransomed, I'm restored, resurrected, I am yours, I am love, yes I belong, oh my soul has found its home. There are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome. There's grace enough. When I have wandered, Lord, your cross is the open door. There are no outsiders. I'm not an outsider. Well, last weekend, our senior high youth returned from a week-long mission trip with an organization called Smoky Mountain Outreach. They hosted our group at a camp a few hours away, and they cooked all the meals and organized our group along with a bunch of other groups into mission teams, and they gathered up work materials and led evening worship for our group. And our youth spent the week serving neighbors who they had never met by working at food distribution sites, by staining and painting some decks and porches, by clearing some fields and hauling debris and more. The effort required for this labor was not something that most teenagers often summon up, and especially not during summer vacation, right? Well, not all of these youth had done these activities before or served in these ways, 
and not everyone had the supplies on, on hand or at their home that they could bring with them so that they could do these work. They had to have that brought and, and supplied for them. But our group did have one thing that helped. They had the support and the prayer of First Church. Because of your support and the three adults who gave up a week of their time to go with them, our youth group had an amazing week where leaders stepped up and lives were recommitted to serving Jesus and the kingdom of God was made known to our neighbors. Because all of you support First Church with your prayers and your presence and your gifts and your service and your witness, our youth ministry can make more and better disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It is because we support our youth that they are being transformed and the Spirit of God is transforming the world through them. If you want to support the ministries of First Church financially today, you can do so by leaving an offering in one of the offering boxes found on the walls or by going online to our website and making a donation there. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God, creator of all. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Today, I am so excited to welcome a friend and colleague, the Reverend Sharon Bowers. She is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church in the Holston Conference and is currently serving at Emory and Henry College, my alma mater, so that's also a bonus as the Special Advisor to the President on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Reverend Bowers has been in ministry in many different capacities for more than 30 years as a teacher, as a pastor. We've served together on boards and committees and on ministry teams, and I am just so excited to get to hear her preach today. And I'm excited to share her with you, with this congregation that I love. And even though I was supposed to be out of town today and I'm not, this is a little bit of a bonus for me to be here with her. So um, today, let us welcome the Reverend Sharon Bowers. Well, good morning, everyone. I greet you in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, the one that was, the one that is, and the one that is to come. I'm so excited to be here, and I thank Reverend Jody and Reverend Gary for having me here, and my prayers are with the both of you today and always, your family, your children, and I'm really excited that there are some people who are here. <laughs> I, I, I weighed it myself. I thought, fun in the sun, S-U-N, fun 
in the sun, S-O-N, fun in the sun, fun in the sun. Okay, so we're here. <laughs> and, and I'm excited about that. So why don't you just give yourself a, a hand clap or a pat on the back? Because we know that this morning you could have been at the lake. And you're not, you're here. I want to read a scripture in your hearing. If you'll turn in your Bibles or if it's on the screen to 2 Kings 5 verses 1 through 15. And I'll be reading from the Common English Version translation of our Bible. Naaman is healed. Naaman, a general for the king of Aram, was a great man and a highly regarded by his masters because through him the Lord gave him victory to Aram. This man was a mighty warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now Armenian raiding parties had gone out and captured a young girl from the land of Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master could come before the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his disease. So Naaman went and told his master what the young girl from the land of Israel had said. Then the Aram's king said, go ahead. I will send a letter to Israel's king. So Nahum left. He took along 10 kikers of silver, several thousand shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. He brought the letter to the Israel's king. It read aloud, along with this letter, I'm sending you my servant Naaman so that you can cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his clothes. He said, what am I, God, to hand out death and life? But this king writes me asking me to cure someone of his skin disease. You must realize that he wants to start a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that Israel's king had ripped his clothes, he sent word to the king, why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. Then he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. Nahum arrived with his horses and his chariots. He stopped at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent out a messenger who said, go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and become clean. But Naaman went away in anger. He said, I thought for sure that he'd come out and he'd stand and he'd call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the bad spot and cure the skin disease. Aren't there rivers in Damascus? The Abena, the Farfa, better than all Israel's water. Couldn't I wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. Nahum's servants came up to him and spoke to him, Our father, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. He returned to the man of God with all his attendants. He came and stood before Elisha saying, now I know for certain that there is no God anywhere on earth except in Israel. Please accept a gift from your servant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to just talk for a few moments uh, about where we are and what we can do. And, and if you could, would consider for a few moments just that we're going to talk from the perspective of open hearts, open minds, open doors. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. Oh, choir. No, come on. Sing, sing to the glory of God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this preaching moment. God, we ask that you be with us, that you touch us supernaturally, God. We ask that you open our eyes so that we might be able to see what the Spirit is saying. God, we ask that you open our ears so that we might be able to hear what the Spirit is saying. But more importantly, God, open our hearts so that we might be able to see, hear, and know what the Spirit is saying. And then our commitment wouldn't be not to just be hearers of your word, but to indeed be doers. In all that's holy, we pray. Amen. Our text today is such that we've already been got started on it, huh? But we're going to, uh, let me just get called up with myself here. And, and in doing so, I just want to take a few moments to, in case you all don't know it, you all have amazing people for your pastors. You have amazing leaders, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. You have fighters and you have people who want to do the will of God. And that's really all we need is people who want to do the will of God. I'm blessed to see Reverend Ferguson, who I've known for many, many years. I saw her face and said, hey, I know you, don't I? Yeah, I know her. So it's just good to be here with all of you all. So let us turn our minds and our focus to open hearts, open mind, open doors. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. The United Methodist Church, if you will, we've uh, had been promoting this tagline or had this uh, slogan or whatever you want to call it, this marketing concept for over 20 years. Yes, we've had open hearts, open minds, and open doors, and that really is one of our claims to fame. But in our lesson today, we're going to be able to see how important it is for each of us if we want to be a witness to the miraculous workings of Christ or of God, we want to be the kind of people that have open hearts, open minds, open doors. So in our lesson today, Nahum, his name means pleasant, or he comes to the stage and he is a general. He's in the, the, the king's army and he's regarded as a great man. He's regarded as a king. Uh, the king thought really highly of him. And, and this was really important because he's perceived as a mighty warrior. He's got this reputation. He's bad to the bone. He, he's able to do things when he's in pressure or under pressure. He's able to do it. He's, he's got a life that represents all things that are good. And people respect him and people honor him and people come from near and far. And he can just speak the word and things can happen. But like most people in his life, he encountered some adversity. He comes up against something that he cannot handle. You know how it is for most of us. We're going along in this world. Life is good. We're doing all the right things. We're going all the right places. We're saying all the right things. Everything's going wonderful. It couldn't get any better, so we think. You may have your dream job. You may have the man or woman of your dreams. Uh, you, you've got a new house. You've got a new car. You've got the raise. Everything is going just the way you expected it. And then something happens, and it's turned upside down. In the twinkling of an eye, your whole world changes. I preached a sermon one time that said, what a difference a day makes. Just think about it in our lives. It's, it's going great, and then something happens, and then we have to figure out how to move from this screeching halt to a life that we want for ourselves. Well, in this case, the text says that Nahum, he's diagnosed with a skin disease. He's a leper. And we know specifically it's, this is what his leprosy is. There's all kinds of leprosies, all types of it. But we know that his is a skin disease. We even know specifically that he has a spot. But just imagine for a few minutes that you're like Nahum. It hits you with a ton of bricks. And he has this incurable disease. There's nothing that chemo can do. There's nothing that radiation can do. There's no topical ointment that you can put on it. Nothing can happen. He's received a message that no one ever really wants to hear. In the language that we have today, he probably heard something like, there's nothing else that we can do. We've done all that we can do. And so here he is, chance and circumstances. I want to just put a pin in it for a few moments and let us know that if you live long enough, Chance and circumstances are going to happen to all of us. And even though the text is silent about what Nahum does or what he says, I imagine he would have spent all of the money he had to try to get cured. 
I imagine he, like the woman with the issue of blood, he would have gone here, he would have gone there, he would have asked about this, he would have asked about that. Now we know he's still social, so he's not been ostracized as we read in the New Testament scripture. He's not been ostracized where he has to run around hollering unclean, unclean. He may be in the early stages or he may have the kind that allows him to stay with his family. But nonetheless, I'm sure he's tried everything he possibly could do to get well. But sorry, General, there's just no help for you. Now, now, if money could make a difference, we, we read in the text that he had enough money to make a difference. I don't know about you all, but when I realized that God was in, really in control of my life was I was a young person, and I heard Jackie Kennedy Onassis was diagnosed with, I think it was Hodgkin's lymphoma or something, and she didn't get well. And I realized that no amount of money that a person has will ensure that they get well. That some of us, plain and simple, are going to need miracles from God. And so I once pastored a church in Pulaski, Virginia, and, and I, there was a song that I heard uh, they sang on the way to the internment. And they sang a song, and the lyrics were kind of like this. They said, I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse. They really sang that. <laughs> Y'all, I'll, I'll get them to give you the whole thing. But that's what they said. <laughs> I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse. And so what we realize in there is that we can't take it with us. And in this case, Naaman, he was sickened to death. The case was closed. There was no opportunity for him to get well. In other words, at that particular time, God did not have a miracle with Naaman's name on it. But I'm grateful that God always has a plan for our life. And I stand here as a living testimony that God can heal and God will heal. I don't know if there's anybody out here who knows it, but if you, if you know that God can heal, just do a little bit of a wave. Yeah, there's some people who've got a testimony. There are some of us who've been through some things, and we know that no matter how it looks, that God is sovereign and God has the final say. So even when it looks like we're getting ready to go down for the count, even when we're about ready to throw in the proverbial white towel, God can still do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask, hope, or think. I tell people all the time how important it is for us to be kind to people along the way because we never know who's going to be able to give us that drink of water. We never know who's going to be the one that's going to care for us when we need it. So regardless of where we are right now, our stage can turn and change at any time. Some of us might think we're high and mighty. Some of us might think that we can turn our nose up at people and, and maybe we're in a different socioeconomic uh, class. Maybe we have a different skin color or ethnicity or maybe people we don't believe like other people do. Maybe we don't identify with the more uh, heteronormative gender that we think we should, but there are all kinds of people in this world. And whether you know it or not, if you read the rest of your Bible in Revelations, it lets us know that there's going to come a time when there are going to be all kinds of people that gives us a glimpse to the future. There are going to be members of every tribe, every people, every language standing before a throne, before the Lamb, praising God. I can't wait on that day. But Nahum, let's get back to the story. Nahum, he, 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 he's been able to do all kinds of things. And he's previously captured this young girl from Israel. And the text says that she's been enslaved and she's gone to his wife and she's the wife's mistress and, and, and is her mistress and she is uh, doing all these things that need to be done for the family from a perspective of enslavement. Now, uh, Pastor Jody read and told you that I work with diversity, equity, and inclusion at Embry and Henry College, and sometimes that's difficult because I'm constantly aware of people who feel like they are the outsider, people who feel like they have not been included, people who feel like they are not part of the party. And so um, I tell people all the time, years ago there was a song by Three Dog Night, and it said one is the loneliest number there could ever be. So sometimes when you look around and you see that you're the only one somewhere, sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes it's difficult. So sometimes we want to be cognizant of other people when they come to our church and when they come and be in our presence. But this young slave girl, if you will, this young enslaved girl, she's at the lowest social position she possibly could be. But somehow she has an open heart. Somehow she wants to see her master, the person who's enslaved her, she wants to see him healed. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would have that kind of heart. I don't know if I would have been sitting somewhere saying, I know something that can help you, or if I would have been sitting there waiting, oh, I'll be so glad when he's gone. You don't have to raise your hands, but you can raise your heart. But I wonder which side 
of that coin most of us would have been on. But it goes on and on, and, 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 and she, she gives him an opportunity to get some help. So she's powerless, if you will, and Nahum is all powerful, and, and, and sh but she tells him what he can do. So he decides that he's going to do it. He goes and he tells his master, uh, he tells his king what he wants to do, and, and he, he knows that it's possible for him to get out of the situation that he's in and get to a better situation. Naaman decides to seize the moment. He tells the king that the enslaved girls told him about this opportunity. She opens her heart, and she provides something to him. She could have kept quiet. She didn't have to say anything. She could have been bitter, but she did. She told him how he could get help. And Nahum seizes the opportunity. He decides that he's not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. He's not going to let gender, he's not going to let ethnicity, he's not going to let class separate him from the very thing that he needs more than anything. So the king gives him permission to go, and he takes this opportunity. He goes, he takes a letter from the king. We read in your hearing, you hear all the stuff that he takes with him. He takes all this kind of stuff with him. And, and I imagine for the first time, Nahum is now excited again. He actually believes that he's going to be healed. His heart is probably racing fast. He's probably got his swag back. He sees a glimpse of hope. He thinks this is going to really work for me. Many times in our lives, we think we've arrived. Many times in our lives, we think we have everything that we ever wanted. Many times we think that the door has been swung wide open and we can walk right through. Sometimes that's difficult for other people if, uh, it, when we think that maybe we're part of the right family or we've got the right privilege because we've been randomly assigned a skin color and we identify with the appropriate gender or because our standard of beauty is a preferred one, we can just walk right in. We think that we are all that and a bag of potato chips. The letter from the king tells exactly what he wants to happen. He sends a letter to the other king, and he says that he wants Nahum to be cured of leprosy. And, and we, we heard in the hearing earlier that when he gets there, the king of Israel tears his clothes. And, and, and we know that the tra tradition says that when you tear your clothing, usually it's in mourning, or you put on sackcloth, or you put on ashes, or you shave your head, or you do something that says that your heart is broken. And so in this situation, the king does that, and he asks this question like, does he think I'm God? He asks this question, what does he want me to do? And he actually thinks that there's going to be a fight. He actually thinks that the other king is picking a fight with him. And so he's probably got some fear and doesn't really know what to do. But thanks be unto God that Elijah is on point. And Elijah is part of the prophetic. And so he knows what is going on. And so he has a conversation with him and he says, just send the man to me. I can handle this. I can take care of it. I can let him know for sure that there is a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman goes, and he goes to Elijah's house. And just imagine when he gets there, he gets there, and he's ripe with leprosy. He arrives at the prophet's house. He's all messed up. He, he, he's in need of a miracle. He thinks he's going to get one. He, he believes that he's going to get one. And, and I don't know about you, but when I looked up what a miracle is, it just simply said that a miracle defies science and nature. But he knows that he needs something. He knows he needs something that he hasn't had. He knows he has, needs something that he's got to get. In other words, Naaman is standing there. He's on his last leg, probably. He needs the miraculous working power of the sovereign God of the universe. So he comes to the prophet's house. He has all this stuff. I read in your hearing earlier, he comes with the chariots. He comes with his money. He comes with his wealth. He comes with all these things. And he thinks that things are going to happen the way he wants them to happen. Many times in our lives, we have expectations, and we expect things to go the way that we want them to go. And we expect it sometimes just because we think we have it like that. But Naaman, he gets there, and he, he's looking for an answer that says that he can be healed. He's looking for this miracle. He's looking for the word from the Lord. He's looking for it from this least likely person. He gets there, and, and, and things don't really go the way he planned it. He goes there full of all his biases because he actually believes that his money will make room for him. He actually believes that when he gets there that the, the uh, prophet will come out. The text says the prophet will come out and wave his hand or wave it over the spot of leprosy or do something and he'll be healed. But if you read your Bible, you know that it really doesn't go that way at all. 
what actually happens is that Elisha sends a prophet, and it may be Gehazi who he sent, but he sends, a, he sends a, a messenger to him. And he sends the messenger and he says, tell him this is what you need to do to be healed. You need to go down to the Jordan River and you need to go in there, dip seven times, and you'll be made clean, you'll be made whole. Now, what would you do if that were your choice? You really want a miracle, you really want something to happen, but you really want it to happen the way you want it to happen. You don't want to go to the dirty Jordan. Now, I know some of us who go to Israel. I've been to Israel, and maybe some of you, and y'all are going to go. But anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, and, and so there are some people who want to do a remember your baptism, and they want to go down to the Jordan, and it's all excited and all of that. But the reality is the way that the Jordan is set up, it's a pretty funky river. It's pretty dirty. It's pretty ugly, and it's got all kinds of things in it, and so um, nobody really wants to go there. And so Nahum asked the question, he says, aren't there other rivers in Damascus that you could have sent me to? Aren't there other ones that have crystal clear water, that have pebbles down on the bottom that I can see where I'm going? He wanted it the way he wanted it. He didn't want it the way that God had for him. So he goes and, 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 and he, he, he decides to leave, and the text says that he leaves in anger. He leaves in anger he, because it doesn't go the way he planned it. He leaves in anger. I don't know about you. You're here today, and so I'm not preaching to the choir, but sometimes people just leave in anger. They don't understand what's going on. It's not going the way they want it to go. And so they just say, I'll take my toys, and I'll go home. But God is calling us to be obedient and to listen to what the Spirit is saying. And in this particular case, Nahum decides to leave. And, and his, his people, his entourage, the people that are with him, they ask him a question. Why are you making a big deal out of this? If he asked you to do something more difficult, would not you have done it? And so what I really like is that not only did the young woman earlier, we talked about have an open heart and help Nam to see that there was another way, but here he's got other people helping him to see that he can have an open mind, that he can elevate his mind, that he can get himself together, that he can stop thinking, uh, his stinking thinking, he can stop doing what he's doing and thinking that it can only go his way. And so they get him to think that maybe he should do that. Maybe he should go back. Maybe he should take the bath in the Jordan. Maybe he should get off his high horse. Maybe he should let God do something for him because God can do anything but fail. And so he goes, and he's obedient, and the story tells us that what happens is that he's made new. He's, his skin is turned back like it was as a young child or a young boy. And so he understands that obedience in this case is better than any sacrifice that anybody could ever make. He also finds an open door. He goes down to the dirty Jordan. He dips. He bathes. He's made brand new. What an awesome opportunity to be made brand new. Doors are opening constantly for us, y'all. They are. God is knocking on the door, asking us to open the door and let somebody in. Let somebody in who doesn't look like us, who doesn't act like us, who doesn't talk like us, who doesn't walk like us. God is asking us to open the doors wide open and let God's people come in. The text says that his skin is restored, he's made new, and then what happens is he goes back to Elisha, and he wants to give Elisha some stuff. And Elisha doesn't take it. But what I like that really happens is that Nahum understands who's in control. He understands after his experience that it's only God and God alone, and that God is working some things out for us even when we can't see how God's doing it. Because our ways are not God's ways. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. It's separated as high as the heaven is from the earth. And so we have to just take a few minutes and let God be God, and all of our enemies will scatter. So he says in, in his experience of God, he says something, his declaration is that he knows for sure that there is no God anywhere on earth except in Israel. I wonder how many of us need to take a few moments and just quit pretending that we're God and allow God to be God. We cannot possibly know the future that God has for us. 
Because if we knew the future, we'd be all in it, trying to orchestrate, trying to make it happen right now. And yet, the plan is there for us, the plan of good, not a plan of evil, a plan for us to prosper and to bring about an expected hope. So I implore you on this day, on this Independence Day, that you decide to get free, that you decide to no longer hold on to all of your embedded theology, to no longer hold on to your embedded ideology, to no longer hold on to the things that your parents told you and their parents and their parents before them, but to have some deliberative theology, to sit around the table, to talk with people who don't look like you, to talk to people who don't act like you, to consider other people and their hearts, and to see if it's quite possible that we are more alike than we are different. So I implore you to open your heart. Open your heart to the things that God is saying. Open your heart to the thing that God is doing. Open your heart so that you can receive what God has for you. I implore you to open your mind. Elevate your mind. Get yourself together to, to, to get it to where you can start seeing things that God has an opportunity for a miracle for each of us every single day if we would just open our minds. There's a miracle, if you will, in celebrating diversity, in celebrating equity, in celebrating inclusion, in celebrating belonging. There's an open-mindedness uh, that if we just start to embrace and we let people be people, you'll find the darndest friends in the least likely place if you'll only be willing to open your mind and imagine that they could be your friend. And then open doors. I implore you to open doors. Open the door and see what God has for you. Open the door here in this community. This church has been here a long time, I can tell. I can tell it's been here a long time. And thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. But what else could this church be? What else could this church do? Who else could be in this church? What could this church look like? Could this church actually look like the Revelations text? Could there be people here from every tribe? Could there be people here from every nation? Could there be people here from every language? Could there be all kinds of people? Could there be all genders? Could everybody have an opportunity to come and to worship and to get to know the saving grace of Jesus the Christ? Or are you just holding it for you, for your four, and no more? So I, I implore you more than anything today, those of you who are here, and then when you go back and you tell your friends and your neighbors and the people who weren't here that that crazy black woman, that Pastor Jody and, and Pastor Gary brought this crazy black woman in, and she actually asked us to open our doors wide so that other people might come. God wants you and I to have a miracle today. And he wants us to have a miracle that involves us having open hearts, open minds, and open doors. For some of us, we may need to ask God to create in us a clean heart. We might have to ask God. God did it when David prayed the prayer after Bathsheba. When he, when he said, have mercy on me, O God according to your loving kindness, according to your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly of all my iniquities, and cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. Today, as we partake in the Eucharist, it may be a good day, a good day for us to ask God to open our hearts, for us to ask God to open our minds, but more importantly, for us to be part of the people that decide to open our doors so that all God's people can come together and we can be as one. The same can happen for you and it can happen for me. Let it be so today and always in all that's holy, amen.
with me in your Bible, in your hymnal to page number 13. Page number 13. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now we ask, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to, say, to pray with all confidence. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. For the Lord is One of the things that's part of my, my custom, where I come from, one of the things that we say, we say we're going to do this as often as we do it in remembrance of him. But I wonder if there's anybody real quick who has a remembrance of what God has done for you or what Christ has done for you. Is there one real quick that could remember? You ha can you share? I remember when I was brought up today, uh, sitting in the second row of the church, blue shirt on, black pants. I remember the feeling when it washed up. Amen. Amen. Is there another? Anybody remember? Because that's what this is. He says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Is there another? Oh, hallelujah. Restored sight. Is there another? Sharon, I was baptized right here, second one from the inside corner, 1967. Amen. <laughs> I know it was the blood. <laughs> Is there another? What we want to do, if you don't want to do it now, you don't have to, but as you partake, remember what he's done for you. Remember, for some of us, had it not been for the Lord that was on our side, we would have already been consumed. So think about that as we partake and as we share. Amen? This is the body of Christ broken for you. 
This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, eat, remember. This morning, as we share together in Holy Communion, we will again be using the small cups and bread, and you will come from the outer aisles, receive your bread, receive your cup, place your used cup into a bowl on either side, and then return to your seats to the center. If you are in need of a gluten-free option on the main level, we'll have that in the center. You take your cup from the tray and then take your gluten-free bread from the center. If you are in the balcony, you can remain in the balcony and exit to your left and receive your bread and cup. And there's also a bowl for your used cup and then return back to your seat. If you would like to have communion brought to you where you are for whatever reason, just let one of our ushers know as they get closer to you and uh, we will do that as well. The choir will be served here and you will return back to your seats when you're finished. If you are joining us at home and are sharing in communion, we know that we are bound together by the body and blood of Christ near and far, and we encourage you to participate and to uh, pray for one another wherever you are, that we may be in unity and in community.
as we today, I'd like to just, if you feel safe, just reach over and touch the person's hand that is near you. If you feel safe, don't do it if you don't. <laughs> I want you to do that because you have an awesome opportunity. As long as the blood is running in your veins, you have an opportunity to do something different, to be something different, to go somewhere different. But when the blood is no longer running in your veins, there are no do-overs in death. So I encourage you on this day, as a matter of fact, I implore you on this day to be the kind of people that have the open hearts, the open minds, and open our doors. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor, glory, power, dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.